Einstein once famously said, a person who has not made his great contribution to science before the age of 30 will never do so. When I first heard this quote at the trailing age of my teens, I started to panic. <laughs> I mean, for me, it, I could not figure out how I was going to beat this looming expiry date, given that, amongst other things, I was born in a small tropical island in the middle of the Indian Ocean called Sri Lanka. It wasn't that I didn't have dreams or ideas or the ability to work really hard. It was a little more complicated than that. I wanted to be a marine biologist. And yes, the Indian Ocean is the third largest ocean basin, and Sri Lanka is an island surrounded by water. But where I come from, being a marine biologist is totally unheard of. When I told people that that is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, many of them asked me how I would use that degree and if I couldn't be more useful. <laughs> of course, nothing was going to get in the way, not the naysayers, nor a ticking clock. And I dedicated, you know, the rest of my life, basically, basically trying to pursue this dream and explore my options. And I've had an incredible adventure. I started off in Scotland, where I did my undergraduate degree in marine biology. And while I was doing this degree, I took on a couple of odd jobs to support myself financially. The first one was at the university's call center where I was fundraising for the university while obviously fundraising for myself. Um, and I partly took on this job because I wanted to overcome my self-diagnosed fear of the telephone that I call phonophobia. <laughs> At some point, I also found myself working as a tatty roger. Now, any of you who are not familiar with this term, a tatty roger is a person who digs out rotting potato plants to make sure that the rest of the field is maintained and healthy. It was hard labor, I can tell you that, but it paid really well. And that meant I could save up enough money to go to New Zealand after graduation. Once in the land of the Kiwi, I worked as a conservationist, and I lived in a tent through the entire time while also applying for my master's degree. Six months there, and then I swept myself off to the Maldives where I got on a whale research vessel that was circumnavigating the globe. The only reason they allowed me on that boat was because I wrote to the owner every single day for three months until he invited me on board. <laughs> Knowing, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Knowing how rare opportunities like this were in my part of the world, there was clearly no room for any self-respect. My two-week stint turned into six months, as I worked as hard as I possibly could to keep them happy, but also to make the most of this incredible opportunity I had been gifted. After this, I wrapped up, moved to England, did my master's, yes, I did get in, and um, following which I moved back to Sri Lanka and reconnected with the local conservation community. My curiosity for the ocean and my strong desire to understand why us humans are so much more familiar with far-off places like the moon, but have so little connection with the ocean, which forms the vast majority of our planet and lies on our doorstep, drove me to become not just a marine biologist, but also an educator, and subsequently to go on and found the first ever research project on blue whales in the northern Indian Ocean, called the Sri Lankan Blue Whale Project. I was drawn to this population by a chance encounter of an aggregation of blue whales and a floating pile of poo. <laughs> That's right, not everyone can say their life journey was inspired by a pile of shit, but mine was. <laughs> and you can probably see why this poo caught my eye. But over the years that I've been working with this population, I've come to realize more and more how unique and unorthodox they are compared to all blue whale populations anywhere else in the world. Most importantly, they don't undertake these long-range migrations between cold feeding areas and warm tropical breeding and calving areas. It's really uncommon in the whale world. But instead, what they do is they feed, breed, and calve in the warm tropical waters of the northern Indian Ocean, five degrees above the equator, around Sri Lanka, my own home. And I have to confess, I've never actually seen a blue whale feeding, so how do I actually know this? The poo. 
The reason I got so excited was because seeing poo usually says that there's an animal feeding in the vicinity, and the red coloration indicates that they were feeding on tiny shrimp-like creatures. Apart from this, these guys, they speak a different dialect to blue whales in other ocean basins, so they can't chit-chat with their nearest neighbors. Neither would they be able to talk to the blue whales that actually use this coastline seasonally. And while their Antarctic counterparts grow to like a whopping 100 feet, these guys grow to 80 feet and are called pygmy blue whales. <laughs> Go figure. They also display a few different behaviors to blue whales in other ocean basins. So, for example, they'll lift their tail fluke up really high before a deep dive, more often than anywhere else in the world. So, after my first encounter with these whales 12 years ago, I've been asking questions and I really haven't stopped. My most, you know, the question that I started off with was, why is it a, that a population of the largest animal that has ever roamed on this planet would choose to live in warm, tropical waters, which are generally considered low in food. And the years of research, through years of my own research, I've actually been able to show that, in fact, the southern coast of Sri Lanka is unusually productive or food-rich for warm waters. And it's largely because of its unique position in the semi-enclosed northern Indian Ocean Basin. Sounds pretty idyllic, right? It's warm, it's tropical, and there's food. What more could you want? Unfortunately, these waters are also home to some of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. Ten kilometers off the south of Sri Lanka, the shipping lanes support all the traffic that travel from the east to the west of the northern Indian Ocean Basin. Think Singapore to Dubai, two of the busiest ports in the world. It's a scary place to be, and I can tell you that from personal experience. But when you're an animal that large, food becomes so important, regardless of the dangers. Sadly, this means a number of these whales get hit by ships and killed, making it the number one threat to blue whales in our waters. Here's a picture of a blue whale that came into the main harbor in Sri Lanka, wrapped on the bow of a container ship, killed on impact. So many of you might be wondering why these apparently intelligent creatures don't just swim out of the way. Well, to be honest, we are all to blame. As human populations continue to grow and our needs just keep going up, we have become so dependent on the shipping industry that 90% of everything is shipped. In fact, shipping traffic is predicted to double in the next 20 years. More ships in the ocean, means more opportunities for whale ship collisions. It's partly a numbers game. But more ships in the ocean also means more noise in the oceans. And while a number of these individuals might be able to hear oncoming vessels and want to know where the sound is coming from, it's very hard to localize yourself when you're in a noisy environment. So sometimes they might move out of the way, but it might be too late. It's like if you were at a cocktail party and everyone was talking to you at the same time, at the same volume. It's really disorientating. And apart from that, sometimes these animals are engaged in activities that are more vital to their survival, like feeding, for example. So they are so distracted, they can't get away in time. Yeah, depressing, right? Endangered species, increasing threats, dying planet. But it's not all doom and gloom. I actually believe ship strike is a very resolvable threat because shipping lanes occur on such a specific path in the oceans, and whales overlap with these shipping lanes in only a portion of their range. So if we can actually identify the areas of highest risk, we can come up with solutions to save these whales. Off Southern California, they've actually shifted shipping lanes to prevent whale ship collisions. And off the east coast of the US, they have strict speed restrictions in place that prevent these animals from getting hit. So my mission is to understand this threat better, try to identify why it's most prevalent, and then solve it. And this mission has taken me halfway across the world to Santa Cruz, California. Why would I want to live half my time in the US when I'm working on a problem in Sri Lanka? Fundamentally, ship strike of whales is a global problem. 
And apart from that, while shuttling between countries is perhaps not the most ideal lifestyle, I've come to realize that if I want to leave this planet a better place than I found it, it's essential. Because the reality is that most conservation-related research money is spent in high-income countries like the US, while, while most of the problems actually exist in low- to middle-income countries like Sri Lanka. In fact, Sri Lanka is listed as one of the 40 worst-funded countries for biodiversity conservation in the world. So if we are to protect our planet's biodiversity, it's essential that we take the approaches developed in the first world and try to adapt them to work on problems in the so-called third world. Building collaborations of this nature give me the opportunity to work with world-class scientists in the US and take advantage of the millions of dollars leveraged to solving these problems in their waters while adapting their results and approaches to something that works in the unique marine ecology and political system of my own home. Our results are also showing that small shifts in the shipping lanes off the southern coast of Sri Lanka can have big wins for the whales, while having minimal impacts on the shipping industry. So I guess until I make my changes on the ground, I may not feel like I've made any great contribution to science. And since just this last week, I um, celebrated yet another I am past 30 birthdays, I decided to revisit Einstein's wisdom and figure out if he was actually right. I, I just wanted to know, am I past my prime? Should I give up? Should I just close up shop, go do something else, be more useful to the world? Um, and as one does in their desperate times of need, I turned to Google for the answers. <laughs> and um, I have to tell you, I found great solace in the fact that there were other people who had been so perturbed by Einstein's bold statement that they had uh, done extensive research on the topic of age and uh, great scientific discoveries. And as it turns out, studies on everyone, from Nobel Prize winners to scientists like myself, have shown that a scientist's greatest potential for discovery starts about their mid-30s and can extend all the way into their 40s. And Einstein was actually wrong. <laughs> so, I have to say these results have left me joyous and hopeful because it gives me time. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, success doesn't happen overnight. If I or any of us are to make our greatest discoveries before the age of 30, sometimes it's m more useful if, I, if you pursue a field that's a little more abstract, like physics or mathematics, rather than one that requires a lot of context, like medicine or biology. And my personal advice to you would be stay away from the large, elusive animals that roam the oceans and cost an arm and a leg to study, and don't pick up problems that involve nations and governments and policy changes. And perhaps, if you do this right, you can plan to be born into a country that can support you in terms of infrastructure and funding to follow your dreams. But where is the challenge in that? <laughs> I have learned through my own journey that persistence, pursuing opportunities wherever they crop up, holding on to your dreams, surrounding yourself with people who believe in you, and facing the challenges with courage and a smile can keep you ticking well past your 30s. <laughs> and I actually think that experience and knowledge and skill counts for so much more. Anyway, if all of us made our great scientific discovery, or any discovery, at our greatest moments at 30, does that mean we would spend the rest of our days dragging our feet doing less significant work until we died? I hope I can make my great contribution to science before the end of my life. But how do all of you choose to challenge the wisdom of Einstein before the end of yours? Thank you.